by Stieg Larsson. Narrated by Saul Reichlin. Prologue A Friday in November It happened every year, was almost a ritual, and this was his 82nd birthday. When, as usual, the flower was delivered, he took off the wrapping paper and then picked up the telephone to call Detective Superintendent Morell, who, when he retired, had moved to Lake Silian in Dalarna. They were not only the same age, they had been born on the same day, which was something of an irony under the circumstances. The old policeman was sitting with his coffee, waiting, expecting the call. It arrived. <laughs> what is it this year? I don't know what kind it is. I'll have to get someone to tell me what it is. It's white. No letter, I suppose. Just the flower. The frame is the same kind as last year. One of those do-it-yourself ones. Postmark? Stockholm. Handwriting? Same as always. All in capitals. Upright, neat lettering. With that, the subject was exhausted and not another word was exchanged for almost a minute. The retired policeman leaned back in his kitchen chair and drew on his pipe. He knew he was no longer expected to come up with a pithy comment or any sharp question which would shed a new light on the case. Those days had long since passed, and the exchange between the two men seemed like a ritual attaching to a mystery which no one else in the whole world had the least interest in unravelling. The Latin name was Leptospermum Myrtacae rubinet. It was a plant about ten centimetres high, with small heather-like foliage, and a white flower with five petals about two centimetres across. The plant was native to the Australian bush and uplands, where it was found among tussocks of grass. There it was called desert snow. Someone at the botanical gardens in Uppsala would later confirm that it was a plant seldom cultivated in Sweden. The botanist wrote in her report that it was related to the tea tree, and that it was sometimes confused with its more common cousin, Leptospermum scoparium, which grew in abundance in New Zealand. What distinguished them, she pointed out, was that Rubinet had a small number of microscopic pink dots at the tips of the petals, giving the flower a faint pinkish tinge. Rubinet was altogether an unpretentious flower. It had no known medicinal properties, and it could not induce hallucinatory experiences. It was neither edible nor had a use in the manufacture of plant dyes. On the other hand, the Aboriginal people of Australia regarded as sacred the region and the flora around Ayers Rock. The botanist said that she had never herself seen one before, but after consulting her colleagues, she was to report that attempts had been made to introduce the plant at a nursery in Jetbury, and that it might, of course, be cultivated by amateur botanists. It was difficult to grow in Sweden because it thrived in a dry climate and had to remain indoors half of the year. It would not thrive in calcareous soil, and it had to be watered from below. It needed pampering. The fact of its being so rare a flower ought to have made it easier to trace the source of this particular specimen. 
but in practice it was an impossible task. There was no registry to look it up in, no licenses to explore. Anywhere from a handful to a few hundred enthusiasts could have had access to seeds or plants, and those could have changed hands between friends or been bought by mail order from anywhere in Europe, anywhere in the Antipodes. But it was only one in the series of mystifying flowers that each year arrived by post on the first day of November. They were always beautiful and for the most part rare flowers, always pressed, mounted on watercolour paper in a simple frame measuring 15 centimetres by 28 centimetres. The strange story of the flowers had never been reported in the press. Only a very few people knew of it. Thirty years ago, the regular arrival of the flower was the object of much scrutiny at the National Forensic Laboratory among fingerprint experts, graphologists, criminal investigators, and one or two relatives and friends of the recipient. Now the actors in the drama were but three. The elderly birthday boy, the retired police detective, and the person who had posted the flower. The first two, at least, had reached such an age that the group of interested parties would soon be further diminished. The policeman was a hardened veteran. He would never forget his first case, in which he had had to take into custody a violent and appallingly drunk worker at an electrical substation before he caused others harm. During his career, he'd brought in poachers, wife-beaters, conmen, car thieves, and drunk drivers. He had dealt with burglars, drug dealers, rapists, and one deranged bomber. He had been involved in nine murder or manslaughter cases. In five of these, the murderer had called the police himself and, full of remorse, confessed to having killed his wife or brother or some other relative. Two others were solved within a few days. Another required the assistance of the National Criminal Police and took two years. The ninth case was solved to the police's satisfaction, which is to say that they knew who the murderer was, but because the evidence was so insubstantial, the public prosecutor decided not to proceed with the case. To the detective superintendent's dismay, the statute of limitations eventually put an end to the matter. But all in all, he could look back on an impressive career. He was anything but pleased. For the detective, the case of the pressed flowers had been nagging at him for years, his last unsolved and frustrating case. The situation was doubly absurd because after spending literally thousands of hours brooding, on duty and off, he could not say beyond doubt that a crime had indeed been committed. The two men knew that whoever had mounted the flowers would have worn gloves, that there would have been no fingerprints on the frame or the glass. The frame could have been bought in camera shops or stationery stores the world over. There was, quite simply, no lead to follow. Most often the parcel was posted in Stockholm, but three times from London, twice from Paris, twice from Copenhagen, once from Madrid, once from Bonn, and once from Pensacola, Florida. The detective superintendent had had to look it up in an atlas.
After putting down the telephone, the 82-year-old birthday boy sat for a long time, looking at the pretty but meaningless flower whose name he did not yet know. Then he looked up to the wall above his desk. There hung forty-three pressed flowers in their frames, four rows of ten and one at the bottom with four. In the top row, one was missing from the ninth slot. Desert snow would be number forty-four. Without warning, he began to weep. He surprised himself with this sudden burst of emotion after almost forty years. Part One Incentive The 20th of December to the 3rd of January 18% of the women in Sweden have at one time been threatened by a man. Chapter 1 Friday the 20th of December The trial was irretrievably over. Everything that could be said had been said, but he had never doubted that he would lose. The written verdict was handed down at ten o'clock on Friday morning, and all that remained was a summing up from the reporters waiting in the corridor outside the district court. Karl Mikhail Blomqvist saw them through the doorway and slowed his step. He had no wish to discuss the verdict, but questions were unavoidable, and he, of all people, knew that they had to be asked and answered. This is how it is to be a criminal, he thought, on the other side of the microphone. He straightened up and tried to smile. The reporters gave him friendly, almost embarrassed greetings. Let's see. Afton Bloodet, Expressen, TT Wire Service, TV4, and where are you from? Ah, yes. Dagens Nieheter. I must be a celebrity, Blumquist said. Give us a sound bite, Kalle Blumquist. It was a reporter from one of the evening papers. Blumquist, hearing the nickname, forced himself, as always, not to roll his eyes. Once, when he was twenty-three and had just started his first summer job as a journalist, Blumquist had chanced upon a gang which had pulled off five bank robberies over the past two years. There was no doubt that it was the same gang in every instance. Their trademark was to hold up two banks at a time, with military precision. They wore masks from Disney World, so inevitably police logic dubbed them the Donald Duck Gang. The newspapers renamed them the Bear Gang, which sounded more sinister more appropriate to the fact that on two occasions they had recklessly fired warning shots and threatened curious passers-by. Their sixth outing was at a bank in Östergötland, at the height of the holiday season. A reporter from the local radio station happened to be in the bank at the time. As soon as the robbers were gone, he went to a public telephone and dictated his story for live broadcast. Blomqvist was spending several days with a girlfriend at her parents' summer cabin near Katrineholm. Exactly why he made the connection he could not explain, even to the police. But as he was listening to the news report, he remembered a group of four men in a summer cabin a few hundred meters down the road. He'd seen them playing badminton out in the yard, 
four blonde athletic types in shorts with their shirts off. They were obviously bodybuilders, and there had been something about them that had made him look twice. Maybe it was because the game was being played in blazing sunshine with what he recognized as intensely focused energy. There had been no good reason to suspect them of being the bank robbers, but nevertheless he'd gone to a hill overlooking their cabin. It seemed empty. It was about forty minutes before a Volvo drove up and parked in the yard. The young men got out in a hurry and were each carrying a sports bag, so they might have been doing nothing more than coming back from a swim. But one of them returned to the car and took out from the boot something which he hurriedly covered with his jacket. Even from Blomqvist's relatively distant observation post, he could tell that it was a good old AK-4, the rifle that had been his constant companion for the year of his military service. He called the police, and that was the start of a three-day siege of the cabin, blanket coverage by the media with Blomqvist in a front-row seat and collecting a gratifyingly large fee from an evening paper. The police set up their headquarters in a caravan in the garden of the cabin where Blomqvist was staying. The fall of the Bear Gang gave him the star billing that launched him as a young journalist. The downside of his celebrity was that the other evening newspaper could not resist using the headline Color Blomqvist Solves the Case. The tongue-in-cheek story was written by an older female columnist and contained references to the young detective in Astrid Lindgren's books for children. To make matters worse, the paper had run the story with a grainy photograph of Blomqvist with his mouth half open, even as he raised an index finger to point. It made no difference that Blomqvist had never in life used the name Karl. From that moment on, to his dismay, he was nicknamed Color Blomqvist by his peers, an epithet employed with taunting provocation. Not unfriendly, but not really friendly either. In spite of his respect for Astrid Lindgren, whose books he loved, he detested the nickname. It took him several years and far weightier journalistic successes before the nickname began to fade, but he still cringed if ever the name was used in his hearing. Right now he achieved a placid smile and said to the reporter from the evening paper, Oh, come on, think of something yourself. You usually do. His tone was not unpleasant. They all knew each other, more or less, and Blomqvist's most vicious critics had not come that morning. One of the journalists there had at one time worked with him, and at a party some years ago he had nearly succeeded in picking up one of the reporters, the woman from She on TV4. You took a real hit in there today said the one from Dagen's Nieheter, clearly a young part-timer. How does it feel? Despite the seriousness of the situation, neither Blomqvist nor the older journalists could help smiling, he said a bit stuffily. Three months in jail and 150,000 kroner damages, that's pretty severe, said she from TV4. I'll survive. Are you going to apologize to Venestrom? Shake his hand? I think not. So, you still would say that he's a crook? Dagen's Nieheter. The court had just ruled that Blomqvist had libeled and defamed the financier Hans-Erik Venestrom. 
The trial was over, and he had no plans to appeal. So what would happen if he repeated his claim on the courthouse steps? Blomqvist decided that he did not want to find out. I thought I had good reason to publish the information that was in my possession. The court has ruled otherwise, and I must accept that the judicial process has taken its course. Those of us on the editorial staff will have to discuss the judgment before we decide what we're going to do. I have no more to add. But how did you come to forget that journalists actually have to back up their assertions? She from TV4. Her expression was neutral, but Blomqvist thought he saw a hint of disappointed repudiation in her eyes. The reporters on site, apart from the boy from Dagen's Nieheter, were all veterans in the business. For them, the answer to that question was beyond the conceivable. I have nothing to add, he repeated. But when the others had accepted this, TV4 stood him against the doors to the courthouse and asked her questions in front of the camera. She was kinder than he deserved, and there were enough clear answers to satisfy all the reporters still standing behind her. The story would be in the headlines, but he reminded himself that they were not dealing with the media event of the year here. The reporters had what they needed and headed back to their respective newsrooms. He considered walking, but it was a blustery December day, and he was already cold after the interview. As he walked down the courtroom steps, he saw William Bori getting out of his car. He must have been sitting there during the interview. Their eyes met, and then Bori smiled. It was worth coming down here just to see you with that paper in your hand. Blomqvist said nothing. Bori and Blomqvist had known each other for fifteen years, disliked the older female reporters in particular. They had their first quarrel, then others, and anon the antagonism turned personal. Over the years, they'd run into each other regularly, but it was not until the late 90s that they became serious enemies. Blomqvist had published a book about financial journalism and quoted extensively a number of idiotic articles written by Bori. Bori came across as a pompous ass who got many of his facts upside down, and wrote homages to dot-com companies that were on the brink of going under. When thereafter they met by chance in a bar in Söder, they had all but come to blows. Bori left journalism, and now he worked in PR, for a considerably higher salary, at a firm that, to make things worse, was part of industrialist Hans Erik Venestrom's sphere of influence. They looked at each other for a long moment before Blomqvist turned on his heel and walked away. It was typical of Bori to drive to the courthouse simply to sit there and laugh at him. The number 40 bus braked to a stop in front of Bori's car and Blomqvist hopped on to make his escape. He got off at Friedhelm's plan, undecided what to do. He was still holding the judgment document in his hand. Finally, he walked over to Café Anna, next to the garage entrance leading underneath the police station. Half a minute after he had ordered a café latte and a sandwich, the lunchtime news came on the radio. The story followed that of a suicide bombing in Jerusalem and the news that the government had appointed a commission to investigate the alleged formation of a new cartel within the construction industry. 
journalist Mikhail Blomqvist of the magazine Millennium was sentenced this morning to 90 days in jail for aggravated libel of industrialist Hans-Erik Wennerström. In an article earlier this year that drew attention to the so-called Minos affair, Blomqvist claimed that Wennerström had used state funds intended for industrial investment in Poland for arms deals. Blomqvist was also sentenced to pay 150,000 Swedish kroner in damages. In a statement, Wennerström's lawyer Bertil Kamnemacher said that his client was satisfied with the judgment. It was an exceptionally outrageous case of libel, he said. The judgment was 26 pages long. It set out the reasons for finding Blomqvist guilty on 15 counts of aggravated libel of the businessman Hans-Erik Wennerström. So each count cost him 10,000 kroner and six days in jail. And then there were the court costs and his own lawyer's fee. He could not bring himself to think about all the expenses, but he calculated, too, that it might have been worse. The court had acquitted him on seven other counts. As he read the judgment, he felt a growing heaviness and discomfort in his stomach. This surprised him. As the trial began, he knew that it would take a miracle for him to escape conviction and he had become reconciled to the outcome. He sat through the two days of the trial surprisingly calm, and for eleven more days he waited, without feeling anything in particular, for the court to finish deliberating and to come up with the document he now held in his hand. It was only now that a physical unease washed over him. When he took a bite of his sandwich, the bread seemed to swell up in his mouth. He could hardly swallow it, and pushed his plate aside. This was the first time that Blomqvist had faced any charge. The judgment was a trifle, relatively speaking, a lightweight crime, not armed robbery, murder.